It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. A little later on, we're going to have a special segment. Uh, my guest, Jim, has a long-time experience in the military and wanted to uh, go over some of the benefits uh, for retirement and retirement planning that might apply to people specifically in the military. Uh, he had sent me an email several weeks back and said, you've never talked about these topics specifically. Uh, could I join you and discuss them? And I thought that was a very nice idea. So uh, we have a segment for that coming up, and we're going to help help out military people. If you've been in or retired or thinking about it, it's not meant to be a sales pitch. Uh, I'm very honored that people go into the military and very thankful for the work that they do. But me, I was too scared to do it. Uh, I don't want to be on the front side of bullets. So uh, I, I appreciate the uh sacrifices that they give and have given. So I uh, just want to get that out there. A couple of other topics. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a house. Is a house an investment? Is it a good investment? And we're going to go over that in a few minutes. But before that, I wanted to go over a thing called T-shares. It looks like many of the big players in the financial services industry have decided they're going to come out with a new share class. And they think this new share class, if everyone puts out mutual funds with the same front end load and the same relative expense ratios, that that will eliminate the conflict of interest. And maybe that would be the case. So a lot of companies are going to issue T shares. And I've talked about switching from A to C and C to A, and I don't think I've talked about T-shares yet, so ho hopefully this is not totally repetitive. I, I talk to so many people during the week that sometimes I forget what I said on my show, but it's important to know, so even if it's covered a second time, uh, it'll be good, but it's just going to be a little short segment. Uh, these new T-shares are going to have generally a 2.5% front-end load, so you've got to make 25 2.8%, something like that to just get back to even. And they're also going to have a 0.25% 12B1 fee. The 12B1 fee is added to your expense ratio, and it is expressly, explicitly added for the purpose of marketing the funds to other people. Generally, what that means is that goes right to the commissioned salesperson. So the salesperson might get 100% of the 2.5%. They might get a half to 7 tenths of an ongoing fee. They might get 100% of the 0.25, or they might, might charge you 1% to 1.5% to 2% to manage your money, and then they get the 0.25% and the 2.5% commission up front. There's nothing preventing them from getting those different uh, things. And one of the philosophies is that as long as they do the same thing to everybody, it's now not a conflict to sell something that has a higher commission uh, versus something that has a lower commission. But we shall see. There's going to be a lot of rules uh, coming out and changing over the next six to seven months with the new fiduciary rule by the Department of Labor. So we've got that. Keep your ears open for that. And if you have an advisor that uh, suggests that you change your shares from one class to another, first of all, it means you're in a loaded fund, which I don't like. You, you already know that as a regular listener. And it also means that if they're doing something that's going to lower your costs, while that is nice and almost noble and honorable, the question I would want to ask is why weren't they providing this lower cost service in the first place? Why do they have to be compelled by law to make it reasonably affordable for you to invest? Is that someone you want to do business with? So anyway, next segment we have here, we're going to talk about your house and 
uh, what the housing market looks like, just some notes on that, and is your home a good investment? I happened across an article at CNN, um, and it talked about a new report that has come out by uh, Harvard, and I'm going to go into that a little bit here in a minute, but the summary on the CNN uh, Money website was that uh, something like 39 million households are paying more than 30% of their income towards housing costs. A commonly accepted norm is that you shouldn't spend more than 30% of your uh, monthly paycheck, monthly income on housing. If you do pay more than 30%, it increases uh, the risk of default. It increases the possibility that at some point something is going to happen to you. You get laid off or a... uh, you know, a slowdown in, in the economy. Maybe you take a week off or you get laid off for a couple of days because there's not enough work. It can be very hard for you to make the payments. It also means you're more likely to cut expenses somewhere else. And so as housing prices go up, if they go up faster than inflation or if they in particular go up faster than the increase in income, it can be problematic for some people. And sometimes it's concentrated in certain parts of the country. So the story from CNN was talking about that, and they listed uh, the the three worst cities, apparently, in the United States at this time uh, are Los Angeles, Miami, and Dayton Beach, uh, Florida, and those were 57 and 62% of the people who have a a property there are paying more than 30% of their income every month on housing. That is not necessarily a problem for the economy as a whole, but it's just something to keep an eye on. And so, of course, I went and found the housing report. And before we get too much into this, I have to make sure that we're clear on a couple of terms. Uh, One is the word real, which it's going to be funny, but the other one is nominal. And real prices, real prices. So like for a house, if a house goes from 110 to 120,000, in real dollar, I'm sorry, in nominal dollars, it went up 20,000. It actually went up 20,000. When they say real dollars, it means when compared to inflation. So if inflation went up during that time, the value of your house still went up $20,000 in nominal dollars, but it's real dollars or the real percentage is not as big. I know they're poor, poorly choice in words. It should be nominal less inflation or something because as soon as you say real, you want to think, well, that's what it really went up. Well, yeah, it's what it really went up when compared to inflation. So keep that in mind and hopefully I don't mix this up during the show myself. So forgive me. But one of the things the Harvard report had is that since 2000, uh, the last 16 years, uh, houses have gone up. 32% above inflation. So the real increase, I'm sorry, yes, is 32% total over 16 years. So, you know, it's a little less than 2% a year. And the long-term historical norm for housing, it goes up about inflation plus a little something. In the long term, in the United States of America, inflation has been around 3%. And there have been studies showing that housing goes up 3, 3.1, 3.5, 3.6, maybe even 4, depending on when you start and when you end. So that all seems to match up. So for the last 16 years, the overall trend of housing prices has been a little quicker, a little higher uh, than one might expect. But it's not anything that I think you need to panic about. But it's something that if you are younger and your income is not as good, if you live in the West, especially along the coast, and it looks like uh, I found a nice map at the Harvard thing, um, there's places where the houses aren't up 32% after inflation. They're up 40% or 50 or 80 or 100% after inflation. The question you have to ask, and I cannot answer it for you, is, is that going to continue? The space along the coastline obviously, is limited. You can't build in the mountains in the West Coast, so space is limited. It can, you know, supply and demand raise costs. Raise costs. In Florida, you have a similar problem. Florida is only so big, and a lot of people want to live there. Now, will there be problems in the future? 
if ocean levels rise and we get more sinkholes, I don't know. That might drive up prices more because there's fewer good areas to live. Just something to be aware of. If you're in the Midwest, uh, if you're in Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, you're you're golden. You, the house prices haven't gone up very much at all, regardless of inflation or not. And matter of fact, the the uh, suburb that I bought in here in the southwest of Chicago, there are houses on the market today that are st- that are trying to sell for ten to twenty percent below their peak in two thousand and eight. Now, I don't know how it compares to this Harvard study because this was from 2000, but they're probably just about what they were in real, not in real, in nominal dollars. So a $250,000 house in 2000 is probably just about a $250,000 house today in 2017. So 17 years later, the houses haven't gone up a lot, which I think is a sign that they're probably not going to go down a whole lot, but you never know. Maybe people keep leaving the Midwest, and even though price houses have been flat, they stay flat or go down, whereas if you had bought a house in San Francisco, which is now apparently the most expensive city in America to live in, your housing values could keep going up and up and up. So I would be totally wrong. I, I don't know. It's just stuff to think about. I generally look at a house as an expense, not an investment, and so I wanted to go over some of that and how that works. We are going to start in the calendar year of 2000 and we are going to look at a house that's worth $100,000 for a lot of places in the United States. That is a ridiculously low price. I understand you can extrapolate this information and it might still be helpful for you to understand your situation in the United States. The average home purchase price is one hundred and dollars $80,000 currently, maybe $200,000, but that includes places like Kokomo, Indiana, where you can get a reasonably nice house for 80 grand and places by Washington, DC, where it might be five or 600,000 or LA, Silicon Valley, you know, Miami beach, whatever that are going to be closer to a million, even for a modest home. So I understand that you can extrapolate this somewhat. And of course, this is not going to apply, you know, to everybody. Real estate is very, very local, but there's same things that they'll share in common. So hopefully this will be valuable to you. Uh, we're not going to look at versus inflation. So we're going to take inflation out of the picture for this calculation, just because it makes it uh, kind of complicated. So everything is going to be in nominal dollars. It's going to be in, you know, dollar for dollar, a dollar is still a dollar, even 16 years later. So if that really bothers you, skip ahead. <laughs> I had to choose. I don't want to make it too complicated. So in 2000, you're going to buy the calendar year 2000. You're going to buy a house worth $100,000. And 16 years later, based on the average increase of home prices over the last 16 years, it would now be worth $180,000. And a lot of people will look at that and say, Wow, something that was worth a hundred is now worth a hundred and eighty. I made a lot of money. Well, the big question is, did you? So we're going to assume that you put twenty thousand dollars down, and if you'd put twenty thousand or twenty percent down on that house, and now you sell it for one eighty, did you make one hundred and sixty thousand dollars? That's the question because you sold it for one eighty. You started with twenty. You now have one eighty. You made one sixty. Well, sadly, no. Nothing's that simple. So let's start with an overly simplified example. We're going to look at a house that did not change in value over the entire 16 years. You bought it for 100000 You sold it for 100000 I know this is ridiculously oversimplified, but work with me for a minute. If your interest rate is 5%, in uh, 16 years, you would have paid $68,000 in interest. That's right. Your one hundred thousand, or I'm sorry, your eighty thousand dollar loan, you're going to pay sixty eight thousand dollars in interest in sixteen years. Now, if you held it for the next fourteen years, you would pay far more in equity than interest because the interest is front loaded. Otherwise, it would just get bigger and bigger. And I know interest rates today are not five; generally, they're four ish. And sometimes in the past, they're 
significantly higher. You can find online tools to help you with this, but I have to pick a number. I picked a reasonably low number, but not the lowest number that one could get in the last few years because, again, we bought this house in 2000 and 5% was a pretty good deal for 2000. So, but in that 16 years, you kept making payments, you did get $35,000 in equity. So you've added $35,000 in value to the money that you put down, but you've also paid $68,000 in interest. Now, the clever listener will know, because we've talked about this before, the interest you pay in your home loan is likely for you to be tax deductible. Now, of course, there's always limits and exceptions and minimums that you have to meet, so check with your personal tax advisor, but we're going to assume that 100% of it for you is tax deductible. We're also going to assume that your marginal tax rate is 25%. Start to see why this gets complicated. So effectively, you're paying $68,000 in interest, but because you get the right sum, or in this case, all of that off, you're effectively only paying $51,000 in interest, and you made $35,000 in equity. Clearly, $35,000 in equity minus $51,000 in net interest payments, you have a loss of $16,000. You put $20,000 down on the house. So 16 years later, what you're going to get in the house that did not go up in value is you're going to get back $4,000 of the $20,000 you put in. So you invested twenty. Sixteen 16 years later, you take out the money and you get four. And I think for most of my listeners, if you knew in advance that you were going to make an investment where you put down $20,000 and 16 years later you would lose 80% of that money and only get $4,000 back, you would take a pass. Now, keep in mind, this was our unrealistic, overly simplified example of a house that did not go up in value at all for 16 years. So now let's start adding a couple bits of complication to it. We're going to look at the same situation with the big change that the house went from 100 to 180 because that is the average change in price in nominal dollars, the actual real dollars. You're, you bought it for 100, you sell it for 180. We're ignoring if inflation. It's built into the price of your house, however you want to look at it, but you sell the house for $180,000. And so it's easy to think compared to the example before that if the house sold for 100 now it's sold for 180 you clearly make an extra $80,000 $80, and you would have made 84 well again it's not that simple if we just stop there it looks like you made 84,000 you put in 20 you get 84,000 out now that's nice that's a you know a four times 400% return on your money or i guess 300% return on your money is a pretty good deal over 16 years Still not incredible, but pretty darn good. But we have forgotten some other things that we must include, we must talk about. And again, I want to stress that these are just estimates, the ballpark numbers. Your situation could vary quite significantly, but something for discussion. Again, in this theoretical example of a house for $100,000, we should include the cost to actually buy the house. Yes, you put down 20% or $20,000, but you had to pay tax, title, licensing, closing costs, points, fees, whatever it is, I'm going to call that $3,000. If you think you can get that done at no cost or 500 bucks or 1200 bucks, you change that number. If it might cost you seven or $8,000, you're going to have to seriously consider whether you want to buy that house because maybe you just need a different lender, but we're going to go with $3,000. Property tax. Property tax varies quite a bit across the United States of America. Now, for some people, especially when housing prices are really high, the tax rate as a percentage may not be that big. Of course, it can still end up being really big money. Uh, I was talking to someone in New England, and they have a nice house, four or five hundred thousand dollars, and they told me their tax bill might be four or five thousand dollars a year. Well. My house is three thousand or three hundred and thirty thousand, and it looks like my tax bill is going to be between eight and nine grand every year. And they were stunned. But when we talk about income taxes 
or the cost to uh, buy groceries or the cost to uh, renew your license on your car every year, they vary wildly state by state. So you're not necessarily comparing apples and oranges. So for this purpose, I've assumed that property taxes are going to be about $2,000 per year. That's a little too low for me on a $100,000 house. And keep in mind, you might get reappraised somewhere along the way, even if you don't do any improvements. If the house value goes up and your county or local government, however it works in your area, reappraises the house and it goes up, you could pay more and more taxes. Again, if you're in a state where a $100,000 house has $100 or $1,000 of taxes a year, lower this number. But keep in mind, as the value of the house goes up, your tax bill will also go up. So I'm assuming $2,000 per year on a $100,000 house. Again, we own it for 16 years. That's $32,000. Another thing that we have to include with housing, and it's a real amount. And I looked over the internet dozens and dozens of places, and the most common number that people came up with for this, is, which is maintenance. From time to time, things in your house are going to need to be fixed. It can be a big thing like a roof or the furnace, or it can be something smaller, we hope, water heater, uh, faucets, broken window. Maybe you've got to patch or reseal the driveway. Things come up, and it's recommended to use 1% per year. And I calculated in the value of the house going up. And that worked out to $22,000 in total over 16 years, even though we only started with 100000 or 1000 per year to begin with. And of course, finally, when you go to sell your house, you have to pay a real estate agent. Yes, I know you can sell it on your own, but that, depending on your situation, may end up costing you more than it's worth. And I'll save that for another topic, but we're going to assume you're going to hire a real estate agent. I think The normal expense for that is about 6%. Some places might be higher. Some places might be lower. Again, you can adjust, but 6%. And it's 6% on your new higher price. Now in 2016, 2017, your house is worth $180,000. That transaction cost, that commission that you're going to pay of 6% is around $11,000. So all of these expenses add up to about... $68,000. So before we took into any expenses, it looked like you were going to clear $84,000. You now have to subtract out the $68,000. And if I've done all this math right, you end up with $16,000 left over, which is less than the $20,000 you started with. So you put in $20,000 and 16 years later, you made money on the house value going up but you paid taxes, you had maintenance, you had uh, costs to buy the house, you had costs to sell the house, and a lot of these things people forget. And a couple years ago, the first time I covered this, you know, someone called me up and said, so my parents bought a house for $40,000 and then 25 years later sold it for $250,000. Are you telling me they didn't make money? Well, <laughs> depends on how you look at it. If you eat all those other costs along the way and, and then ignore them, when you sell the house, yes, you do. You make a lot of money. But on the Phil Ferguson show, we want to look at things differently. We want to look at things trying to include everything. Generally, a house is not a good investment. Now, I also know that it's very easy for me to be misinterpreted. This is not me implying that you should A, be homeless, or B, that you should get an apartment. Although in some markets, an apartment might be a better choice Simply based on cost alone, of course, you won't have the space that you might have in a house or the privacy or the convenience. But what I will say in reference to your investments in your house is my general guidance is you want to get the most affordable house you can live with. Now, what does that mean? Well, it fucking depends on you. Okay, if you really need a big fancy house and you're going to pay for it, fine, pay for it. It But understand, it's likely to be an expense, not an investment. If you can live very modestly and get a very affordable house and it keeps your taxes and repairs and everything else lower, 
you could end up with way more money in your portfolio by getting a smaller house. So look for the most affordable house that you can live with. And and that depends on every, everybody's different. So, you know, get what's right for you, but keep that in mind. Don't go into this idea that you could live with a $100,000 house, but someone has told you you could afford a $300,000 house because of your job, and that would max you out at the 30% income limits. And you should get it because houses go up in value and they make a lot of money. And I just realized I, I didn't even include things like electric, heating, um, trash, sewer, water bills, all those things. I mean, clearly a bigger house costs more to air condition than a smaller house if you're in an area that needs that. So there's a lot of expenses with houses. All of this, of course, breaks down if you bought a house and then 16 years later, the house is worth 25 or 50% less. It All of this kind of becomes moot because you lost a whole lot of money. If, on the other hand, you buy a house for 100000 and 16 years later, it's worth 600000 you made a lot of money. There's no way for me to know those local, regional, temporal variables. You will know more about that than me. And if you don't think that you know more about that than me, which is not unreasonable. I don't know a whole lot about what's going to happen in New Lenox or the Chicago suburbs. So, you know, just keep that in mind that the house is an expense. Don't get carried away. And especially don't get carried away when we've had eight or nine years of increased housing prices generally. Not every area has experienced that. But if your area, the houses are double or triple what they were in 2009, if people are in bidding wars and paying more than the asking price. Just just think about it. It just don't get carried away because if you're wrong, and especially if you only put 5% down, if you buy a $500,000 house, let's just say 10% down for 50,000, and at some point housing goes down 20%, your $500,000 house becomes a $400,000 house. You're upside down by 50 grand and then If you were able to buy this house because both of you had a nice job and one of you loses your job and you can't make the payments, you almost can't afford to leave either. And that's what puts people in a bind and they end up walking away from the house. They file bankruptcy. They lose their house. Things happen. So, you know, save up, especially if you're younger. You buy a very modest house. If it goes up, great. Take some of that equity and buy a more expensive house if and when you ever need to move. Anyway, again, uh, that's some thoughts about housing and housing prices. And we're going to take a little break and then we're going to talk about some benefits that are available for people in the U.S. military. The longer you live, the more you look around, the more you realize something is fucked up. Something is wrong here. War, disease, death, destruction, hunger, filth, poverty, torture, crime, corruption, and the ice capades. <laughs> Something is definitely wrong. This is not good work. If this is the best God can do, I am not impressed. Results like these do not belong on the resume of a supreme being. This is the kind of shit you'd expect from an office temp with a bad attitude. <laughs> and just between you and me, In between you and me, in any decently run universe, this guy would have been out on his all-powerful ass a long time ago. And by the way, I say this guy because I firmly believe, looking at these results, that if there is a God, it has to be a man. No woman could or would ever fuck things up like this. So... All right, everybody, welcome back. I've got a fun and unique segment that is going to focus on the military and retiring from the military. And from time to time, I talk to people that are in the military or retired. And what who I have with me now is, is Jim, and he's a retired military person. And we're just going to go with Jim because he's not really out. And I think the other thing I think I should do, having talked to other people in the military, It's just Jim talking to us. Jim is not representing any branch of the government or the military, and he just wants to talk about information about things that might benefit people that are in or retired from the military. Jim, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Phil. Thanks for having me on. Did all of that sound about right? Yeah, that sounded great. 
great. I just want to make sure I, I know I've talked to people in the military in the past and they've always got to specify they're speaking on their own behalf, n- not as yes. a representative today. And so I, I know I've had some people who are family in the military. And of course I have great respect for people in the military because if for no other reason, I was too much of a coward to uh, put myself in, in the way of, of harm. So uh, I appreciate what people in the military do to make my life easy uh, and theirs is hard. And I get that. Uh, you wanted to talk about retirement. H- how exactly does that work? Wh- you've got to be in what, two or three years to retire? Well, well first of all, let me say uh, uh, we do what we do because of people like you who appreciate us. So, um, but uh, well, uh, a regular retirement is, is a 20 year retirement okay. in the military. You can be in it more than that, but the minimum is, is, is typically 20. Uh, there are also uh, medical retirements. If you get seriously injured or you have an illness that doesn't let you continue your service, you can't get out on what's called a med board. All right. And but so I think today we're going to be typically talking, talking about a, a, a 20 year retirement. Yeah. So you, you work for 20 years and then what do you get from the military after you retire? Well, at 50 years, uh, the current plan is at uh, uh, 50% of what your base pay, well, the average of your last 36 months of your base pay. Okay. So you get 50% of that basically for the rest of your life. Yeah. And then for any, any years over 20 years, you get an additional 2.5% on top of that. Well, that explains I had a, a relative that got a nice promotion. Uh, I don't know what, you know, it went from like E something to another E something. I don't forgive me for being completely ignorant, but it happened in his 19th year. And so he ended up staying 22 years. And now I understand because he wanted three years of that high pay to lock in for life. Yeah. yeah well, also uh, many promotions uh, have a service requirement. So you have to do a minimum of two years after you get promoted to maintain that rank. Ah, okay. So that, you know, there's all kinds of little details. So, Assuming you make 20 years, they take the last 36 months, average it out, and you get half of that forever? Correct. Huh? That's, that's, that sounds pretty nice for throwing yourself in front of bullets for me. I, I, I can live with that. Uh, and there's the cost of livings, but now the government has changed that somehow. It's not going to be 50% anymore? Uh, correct. They, they are implementing a new blended retirement, which... Uh, in, in my opinion, is a way for them to cut costs. Yeah, no, and blended so, sounds like one of those words that are harmless, but it means you're getting fucked twenty percent reduction. <laughs> uh, correct. Well, instead of getting the fifty um, percent at twenty years, it's it's a forty percent, and then you get an additional two percent every year over twenty. But then they they give a, an additional per percentage addition to your thrift savings plan. Okay. Everybody in the military is, is eligible for. And it, what a thrift savings plan is basically a, an IRA. Yeah. Uh, a 401k. And I don't know if I've ever done a straight up whole episode uh, segment on the, the TSP, the, the thrift savings plan. But anyone that's listening, if you're in the military or not, because other government jobs qualify for the TSP as well, you should be using that like a rabid dog because it Absolutely. is an amazing program. When I talk about index funds, this is basically index funds on steroids. The costs are incredibly low. And the only thing I don't like about it is when you get to retirement, you have only a handful of choices. And I don't get to play the little game that I like to have where I have a dozen or more investments. So in case one thing goes up and another thing goes down, you can pull the money out. That's the only drawback I see with it when you actually get to retirement. So if you've got a nice juicy TSP and you're in or near retirement, Give me a call. We can talk about some options you might have. But if you're, you know, in for a couple of years and you're not saving twenty percent in the TSP, you're making a mistake. That that sound reasonable? Oh, absolutely. Um, some of the the uh, calculations that I've seen, um, and you've you've done quite a few in the past. You, you can have six hundred thousand dollars set aside for when you do hit retirement age, just from regular contributions. Well, and of course, if you've got 20 plus in and you get half or even 40% of your pay and you can still work, right? I mean, you're not, 
you're not sitting in a rocking chair. They're not sending you out to pasture. You're just not in the military anymore. Uh, so you can have half pay. And uh, what is uh, what is it? Is it called TRICARE? That's the medical insurance? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, you, everybody's eligible for uh, TRICARE and TRICARE Prime, which are the, the basic uh, health care plans. Uh, TRICARE Standard is free. And then TRICARE Prime, you pay um, a premium. But it's if, actually, if you're over 50% disabled, you have TRICARE for life, which is which is pretty good. So it's free health care for the rest of your life. Free sounds like a really good price, but even a few hundred bucks a year <laughs> is amazing for health insurance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, my premiums are actually pretty low. So it, it apparently can be done that everyone could have health insurance. <laughs> but Oh, uh, absolutely. I just read uh, today, I believe, uh, I believe it was... Uh, Idaho, they're going to start offering where everybody can have uh, Medicare or Medicaid, one of the two. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll have to look yeah. into that. Um, I, I think we're going to... Speak, speaking of uh, disability, yeah. um, many, many, many people nowadays, obviously, are, are disabled veterans as well. Right. And, and so we also, you also get a, uh, you know, your retirement, or your, excuse me, your disability payments as well. And those are tax-free. Well, well, that's pretty nice. You, you sent me a little table here, and if, uh, if I guess this, if you're married, you have a spouse and a child. If you're a hundred percent disabled, uh, it's three grand a month, tax free. Yep, absolutely. That, and that, myself, I'm ninety percent, so I'm getting a two thousand and two. That's real money, dude. Month. Absolutely. And of course, now I had a question, kind of a little aside. Can you still work and make money? Yes. Um, when you're 80 to 100% disabled, you can be rated as either employable or unemployable. If you're unemployable, then you're eligible for Social Security disability as well. Okay. But if you're employable, obviously, you can, you can still work. And most people in the military become workaholics. So you have to go to work after you retire. It's very few people who, who just sit around at home collecting paycheck. Yeah, and I, I know I've never been one to do that. I've, I, this is, you know, the, the last few years, it's been the first time in my life I've had one job, uh, and only one job for about 30-plus years, but I'm still working, you know, sometimes 8 in the morning till 10 at night. But uh, So that's great. So they can make the disability money, or they can make half pay. They can still get another job. Uh, almost sounds like a rec- recruitment pitch. If it weren't for the bullets, this would be a great way to go. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. And yeah, this is something that most people don't even think about or talk about until it hits them in the face. Oh, I'm getting ready to retire. What are my benefits? Right. Also, and that's one of the things I do is I actually, since I've been through the retirement process, people who are getting close to retirement or even been in, say, 10 years, I really hit them up hard about planning for retirement as far ahead as possible. Now, w- when they get to 62, can they also get Social Security or is that... You only get one or the other. No, you you will get Social Security as well. Okay, that's and, something I, I haven't researched yet. Uh, whether or not my uh, Social Security uh, retirement would be lessened because of my retirement from the military, or what? I, I really haven't researched that part yet. Well, I'm going to make an educated guess that the only thing that would happen is you'd pay a little bit more in taxes on your Social Security because of your uh, military pay. But if you find out something different, of course, let me know, and I'll, I'll give the listeners an update in a future episode. Uh, okay, I have a few people who are drawing right now, and I'm, I'm, I can ask them and, and find out. Yeah, fantastic. And you also uh, wanted to make sure the listeners knew that there's educational benefits. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, while I was in the Army, I, I earned my associates in general studies and then my, my bachelor's degree in uh, emergency and disaster management. And while you're in the military, you get 100, or at least the army anyway, you get 100% tuition assistance. So that covers everything, tuition, books, you name it. And then we also have, at a minimum, the post-9-11 GI Bill, which after I got out, I earned my master's degree, and I haven't spent a dime on it. Well, I like the sound of all these programs. I just wish more people could take advantage of it. Uh, Well, yeah, um, most people do. you know, obviously, the people who have been in, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they take advantage of it. Well, you also mentioned, and, and the listeners should know, you're somewhere in the state of Illinois because we're trying to be discreet here, but uh, you were you had sent me some information about the disabilities. Um, 
and and home homestead exemption. Why don't you talk about that a little bit, just in case I have a listeners in Illinois or B, if they're in another state, they may have a similar program in their state. Uh, why don't you cover that for a minute? Oh, great. Uh, Illinois ha- started two years ago. They started the Disabled Veterans Homestead Exemption Act, which if a veteran is 30 to 50 percent disabled, they get two thousand five hundred dollars off of their property tax bill. If they are 50 to 70 percent disabled, well, 50 to 69 percent, they get five thousand dollars off their property tax bill. And then if they're 70 percent or higher, like I am, I don't pay any property tax at all. They're completely exempt. So you and Illinois has very, as I'm sure you are well aware, has some very high uh, property tax. Yeah, it, it's a fascinating thing. I'll talk to some people, of course, uh, on the coasts. The house prices are much higher, but they're stunned to find out that uh, while my house might be a half or a third of what their house costs, uh, my property taxes might be about the same or even higher than theirs. It, it's uh, the state's got to get the money from somewhere, and that's one of the places Illinois gets it from. Um, I think we've covered the bulk of what's on your list. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure other uh, military members or veterans know about? Well, uh, yeah, just check for your state. Every state has some very good benefits. I've looked around at different places to retire, and every every state has some really good benefits. You just have to do the legwork, look for it, put in that little bit of effort, and and just reap the benefits. Now, is there some specific... Uh, office or office position or a name of a person they should look for to, to go get more information? Well, there is a website. Um, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, uh, but if you do a Google search for your state and veterans benefits, you'll, you'll find something on it. Excellent. So if you're a, a veteran or someone in the military, uh, even if you're only in a year or two, make sure you check it out. Make sure you understand because, like I said, I have some family members who who got in the full 20, and it's a pretty nice gig to have uh, half pay and uh, health care f- uh, for the rest of your life. It, uh, it's a great uh, benefit we provide to our military people. So I appreciate that. And, Jim, of course, thank you for your service. And I really appreciate because th- listeners need to know this was Jim's idea. I love it. Uh, that uh, it's something that I haven't covered in depth, so I'm I'm delighted we had uh, a few minutes here to maybe help out some veterans. I'm glad I could help anybody out here that, or out there that's listening. You know, you got to take advantage of those benefits, and uh, I'm going to see you at the Gateway to Reason, I believe. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time and the, the work you did making up this list of ideas. I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, no problem. Any, anything I can do to help. A lot of people come up here and they thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. <laughs> he didn't help me a bit. If it was up to him, Caesar Milan would be up here with that damn dog. <laughs> so all I can say is, suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now. <laughs> You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Well, I don't know about you, but it's been a very exciting week for me at least in reference to the podcast. As the regular listeners know, we moved the feed, and it was all supposed to be seamless. But, you know, sometimes things in life never go as we expected. Uh, The problem we had was that the direct feed for everything was going through PolarisFinancialPlanning.com, my businesses, my personal website, and thousands and upon thousands of hits every day and people pulling the feed from there apparently was just enough to tip me over the scales as the show grew for the website to slow down. So we were in the middle of a revamp of the website and trying to get all of the podcast players to just pull the feed straight from Spreaker. And I guess you do this thing called a redirect or a forward where you tell the internet's to stop looking here for the web feed, for the podcast feed, but to go look at this other place over at Spreaker and just get it directly. It saves a step. Hopefully it should prevent future problems. And we did that and we thought it worked. Well, the uh, number of downloads dropped 60, 70, 80%. And obviously, 
something was missed. We added some more things, added some more things. We thought we had it all fixed up, but there were some uh, podcast players that were still reporting absolutely no downloads. And, you know, the question is, is that information not getting to Spreaker? Uh, or were people not getting those downloads? And it looks like people were genuinely not getting the downloads. And so I'd love to welcome back the people that use things like uh, Downcast and uh, I think uh, Go Potter and Player FM, you know, some of the smaller ones. But, you know, amazingly, the uh, platforms that generate some of the biggest traffic are Apple and iTunes. And one would think once you see the show on iTunes, everyone would see the show on iTunes. But apparently that's not necessarily true, and uh, it may take uh, Apple slash iTunes a while to propagate, and we think we've now achieved that. Or they also pull from different sources depending on the, f- the, v- the phone, particularly the device that you're using in the specific app, or I don't know. I don't know how all that works, but we think we got it fixed. So we're very happy about that. Uh, on iTunes, I do have two new reviews, and... Sadly, one of them is one star, uh, and this is from Split Dafur. I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but the review is one star, and it says, where did you go? So hopefully you're now listening to the show, and hopefully now you can go change your one star back to five stars or up to five stars. I'm delighted that you're upset that you couldn't get the show, but uh, ratings actually affect the show's performance because... The uh, podcast players, or in this case, iTunes, is more likely to refer a show to new listeners. You know, they'll give them things saying, hey, you might like this uh, if it's rated highly. So if you like the show, and of course, if you heard this, it means you found it again. Yay. uh, Go back and uh, change your review. It would mean a lot to me. I also do have uh, another review. This one's a five star by Lick My iPod. All right. Uh, No, I'm sorry, not Lick. Liz K, my pod gun, all right? My iPod. I can't read. It's, uh, I mean, new glasses or something. Thank you for getting the iTunes feed fixed. I did not realize how much I would miss it. I am binge listening today. So thank you so much for the review. And hopefully now everything is back. If you're listening to this, that's fantastic. But if you had to cheat and somehow go and download this from Spreaker and you're not through your favorite podcast player, please feel free to send me a message. Of course, that is phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. And I will have the IT team, because I'm not doing this. I'm not competent in that area. Look at it. We'll try to get it fixed. I think everything is fixed. Um, If you just want to uh, skip fixing and just listen, it's all hosted, held, maintained at Spreaker. Uh, If you need the feed link for your feed... uh, that's listed on the podcast, uh, the uh, Phil- Polaris Financial Planning website. You can get it there. There's a little thing that says get the feed here. And if you still can't figure that out, send me an email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com, and I can send you the the uh, URL, the link directly, and you can put that in your favorite podcast player, and, and that'll solve that problem. So let your friends know it's back. You can go back to sharing. I appreciate it. And we've got some special guests coming up. And I think next week, maybe the week after that, we're going to have David Silverman from American Atheists. And, of course, if you're listening to the show and maybe missed a few, because uh, I can see the traffic is a little lower from the past couple of shows, probably because of the problem uh, we had on Mon- Mandisa Thomas from Black Nonbelievers. And I am doing a match. And they are trying to raise $3,000. If they re- raise $3,000... In the next two weeks, I am going to match it with an additional $3,000. Uh, prior to that, we had Aaron Ra on, and him and I had a great rant on the Bible. And, of course, he is running for political office, and so he could also use your money. We also had Cybabe recovering from religion, an update on Gateway to Reason, which is coming up soon, uh, and that's at the end of July. So I hope to see you there. And I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up. And I hope to see you somewhere this summer or fall at a conference. And please feel free to say hello. And until then, ciao. 